I'm Kalki Kekla and I'm back to bring you another episode of My Indian Life, the video version. I hope you've been enjoying listening to our podcast because I know I've really enjoyed meeting some truly incredible people. Please write to us, message us, put something up on social media, email us. We want to hear from you. And if you do like this podcast, then please spread the word for us. Just tell everyone you know about it. And now for another unique story. He tried to reach out to me. He said, I want to change my life. He said, I've been struggling a lot and I don't want to die. He said, and then I promised him that uh, I, will, I will help him. But I could not fulfill the promise. This is Jen Pu. Sometimes I feel lonely and then sometimes I used to cry lonely, which I cannot show my tears to my friends or families. So sometimes I really cry alone also. There were some times when I even thought to give up, give up my own life. But maybe God wants me to go some other way, I get again motivated. So I close my eyes, I think of my brother, then again I walk. I'm Kalki Ketla with a story that will break your heart and then maybe fix it with hope. From the BBC World Service, this is My Indian Life with tales of being young and Indian in the 21st century. Episode 5, Saving Nagaland. So Jen Poo comes from Nagaland. Nagaland is a very, very beautiful place, full of young people who have a lot of dreams. We always think of the Northeast as different. Why does that happen? It happens because of the looks. We have different looks from the rest of the Indians. And also it happened because we are a bit far away from the mainland India. And what was it like for you growing up there? Tell me a little bit about who is Jenpu. Jenpu is a guy who grew up in an environment where I have seen a lot of people who are into alcohol. A lot of my families are selling alcohol. And I had a very beautiful you know, and happy life also in my childhood days. But so many things were happened, you know. I lost all the smile, all the love, all the things which deserved by a person didn't get to me. So I would say my life was not like an uh, uh, other child. I was beat into situation, into struggling. You said you were first a happy child. Do you remember when that changed, why it changed? So my father, my mother got married and they didn't have a place to stay, so they were staying as a tenant in my uncle's place. So I, I was born there. So my uncle and auntie, they don't have a child. So they got so close to me and I got so close to them. They kind of adopted me. So I How become, old were you? This? At that time, I was two years old when I was so got connected with them. So my uncle expired. It was in a class eight or nine. And then uh, my auntie also has to stay alone and then... She also expired and I have to move back to my parents. I know I don't want to move back to my parents because I know the condition of my parents were very bad. Jenpu's community has a lot of problems. Isolation, poverty and a big one, alcohol and drug abuse. Jenpu saw the impact of that abuse at close quarters. My dad was an alcoholic. He always beat my mom. As a child, who else has the expectation that the parents and father will always take care of their child? But I, I knew that it would not happen. This is Jenpu's dad, Bohem Long. He says, I couldn't do anything for Jenpu, nothing at all. His voice breaks as he talks. Whatever Jenpu is doing today, it is totally him, he says. A single-handed pursuit. What he himself could not do during his childhood, he now wants to ensure that other kids are not deprived likewise. We'll get to what Jenpu is doing today, later. But I wanted to understand more about this childhood first, and his family. What work were they doing? My mother was selling alcohol to feed us. Mm. A lot of hard work. I'm sorry. No, don't worry. If to them there, Talababa be come nice service nigh. Moiparahi, Mohamparahi, Milikin to Duk Laga. 
This is Jenpu's mother, Nuhukulu Raho. She says she had to beg for support from relatives and friends. I had five kids and I couldn't pay their school fees, she tells us. The principal would summon me to school and give me an earful. Education, we could not complete. I dropped out in class nine. My elder brother also, he could not appear at class 10. And my younger brother dropped out when he was in class 8. But I'm happy that at least my mother tried her best. She could help us to reach that level. The children of alcoholics have a very tough time. And that was certainly true of Jenpu, whose father drank. But Jenpu doesn't blame his dad. And now has your relationship with him changed? No, it's, it's good because I did my best to be close with him. He's a sick person now. He's all... So I forgive him. I always want him to be the best dad. So I'm also trying to get close with him and telling him to take part, uh, take the role of a dad. Jenpu feels gratitude for whatever little his parents could provide and worked hard to achieve. Jenpu completed his class 10 with open school by working with a company selling perfumes door to door. Open schooling is basically a flexible education system that allows learners to learn where and when they want, physically away from a school and a teacher. That's what Jenpu did. But his younger brother, David, became depressed and took to drugs. I know that my brother's condition was really going bad to worse. But so sad that my father could not understand that. Did Uh, your brother try to reach out to your family? He tried to reach out to me. I want to change my life, he said. He said that I've been struggling a lot and uh, I don't want to die. I want to change my life. And then I promised him that I will help him. But I could not fulfill the promise. Before helping him, he passed away. The memory of that day still haunts Jenpu. And it changed him and the course of his life forever. Something was saying, you know, inside my heart that that's your brother and do you want to see other brother dying like this? So something was talking to me. So now I started organizations and I, I, I doesn't know anything about angels, how to run and like that. But something was telling me that you should do something and then, then I started working with young peoples and dropouts. Jenpu founded a community network, Can Youth from Dimapur. It's an extraordinary achievement, something positive created by Jenpu in the face of despair. Nagaland has a very serious and growing drug and alcohol abuse problem, among the worst in the country. I asked Jenpu, what makes young people so vulnerable there? One reason people taking drugs is because of frustration, no hope. They don't know where to put their anger, Mm. so they destroy themselves. So exactly that's happened to my brother. He... He realized that he doesn't help. He has so much of anger with my father, maybe with us also. As an elder brother, we cannot support him. But he cannot do anything. So he put all the anger to him and then he started abusing himself. Mm. So we could see a lot of these cases. Kanyut is my, the organization which I founded. Yeah, C-A-N-Y-O-U-T-H. We work with the schools and college dropouts through life skill activities. We want to make them understand that each life has their meaningful life. Okay, let's take a moment to understand what Jenpu does. His community network, Can Youth, helps school dropouts by helping them find ways to pursue their education. And for dropouts who choose not to go back to school, he helps arrange for private agencies in Dimapur to train them. As I talked with Jenpu, I began to understand the scale of the challenge he set himself and the scale of his achievements so far. But how does one person really make a difference when the problem they're staring at is so big and the cause is so deep and complex? Where did Jenpu even start? I know that I'm doing this to reach out to young people who lost hopes. And I know that I'm doing this for my brother. No money. What I did was, um, I went to some uh, big people from within our community who are uh, leaders, public leaders, who are from rich families. 
I remember that I went door to door and I started collecting money. Jenpu had the right ideas, but he needed the means to make a difference. That's when he met Father Jerry. Uh, one of my friends told me that there's one fellowship in Delhi, so you should apply for that. And they have a grant also. Then I applied, and then I got a call that you will be interviewed by Father Jerry. I really want to get this fellowship. So when the interview started, I was telling Father, these are the activities I'm doing. So I was kind of very restless also, like, you know. Uh, and then he was looking at me, and then he was listening to me. Then he just told me, Jenpu, it's okay. You know what? I trust you, he said. This word might be very normal for people, but for me at that time, I was needed that kind of word. I got this fellowship, and from there, I never turned back. And Father Jerry was always with me. He said, I don't care about even you succeed or not. What I care is that you have started. So it was a very big thing for me, that three words. I trust you. We met Father Jerry, who traveled quite a distance to tell us about his work with Jenpu. He opened his heart out as well as his school for us. Wearing a crisp white kurta and a pleasantly infectious smile, his chest swelling with pride, he spoke about Jenpu. From that very romantic idea of wanting to make a change, he has become more realistic. He wants to do a lot of things and he does not hesitate to spread himself out a lot. He takes a lot of risks. Even if he does not have money, he just goes ahead and does what he wants and is very capable of connecting with the communities and raising quite an amount of resources. What amazes me is his group of young people who have joined him. He himself a dropout, managing to attract graduates, postgraduates, and to lead a team of that nature. I think that's not easy. And yet he manages it so beautifully. So now Jenpu had his mission, the right ideas, some funding from Father Jerry, and a few loyal friends and supporters. That's when he started Can Youth. With his younger brother's picture always with him, he set out to help young kids to carve out a better future for themselves. You won't be surprised when I tell you that even then, with Can Youth up and running, it was far from easy. People don't trust when we talk about NGOs. Oh, these NGOs, only for money and all. So mm. this attitude was there. But I didn't give up because I know what I'm going to do. It was very challenging for me to start mobilizing resource. Sometimes I feel lonely and then sometimes I used to cry lonely, which I cannot show my tears to my friends or families. So sometimes I really cry alone also. There was sometimes when I even thought to give up, not the organization, give up my own life. But maybe God wants me to go some other way, I get again motivated. So I close my eyes, I think of my brother, then again I walk. Through Jenpu's irrepressible persistence, Can Youth started gaining momentum. Young people wanted to join his organization, wanted to help. How did you motivate the people around you? It's very difficult to say how I motivate, yeah, because uh, it's the work that I motivate. Motivation is not something that we have to design. It's something that comes from the work. I never try to motivate people. I always focus on my work. So maybe that my genuine work actually motivated them. There was a lot of volunteers also turn up from the schools and colleges to volunteer us in my organization. My friend who started during my initial stage, my friends who supported me, there are still two friends who are still with me, They're still supporting me. Yeah. And uh, how big is the team now? Working team, we have 11. And we have board member around 12. I don't regard them as a team. I never tell them as a staff. Uh, we are all a family. That's we are working like that. <laughs> we met Jenpu's team, a bunch of young people, all between the age of 22 and 30. Most of them women. <laughs> that day when I uh, volunteered myself and helped others, you know, it brought me some joy. You know, I, I was so overfilled with happiness. So I thought that if helping others is giving me pleasure, then why not? Why not be with Kenyut and follow my passion? 
Kibitoli joined Can Youth in 2014. She describes Jenpu as someone who is a role model for the young people of Dimapur. Here in Nagaland, especially in Dimapur, the youths are really very hard to, how do I say, open up. And mostly in rural areas, whenever we go for some programs, they are very afraid. They feel like they are rejected from the society. If you are a dropout, then you are useless and you cannot do anything with your life. And so a lot of parents, they encourage their children, uh, you have to study or else you will be dropped out and you will be like this guy, you will be like that guy, you will be poor. Can Youth is working towards encouraging young people to pursue their dreams, to understand that you can pick up your education later in life, as it's never too late. Where do you see Can Youth going from here? The most important goal is none of the student's child should get dropped out, the first thing. Everyone has to study. The second goal is to create a space in the community where they think that they should change their concept of the education. In most of the society, people think that you are going education because you have to do job. When you grow up, you have to build house. You have to get married. But most of the community don't think that education is not about that only. Education is also about the humanity. So we want to create a movement in the community to think the education in a different way. What kind of impact have you had? Our impact has given to someone life through education. There are many kids who have supported. They thought for the one moment that their life gone. Hmm. But we have brought back them life by saying that if you're willing for education, you will get that education. We have given a life to young people who are looking to start their own unit or enterprise, but they don't have money. So we say that entrepreneurship is not only about money, it's not about rich. Entrepreneurship is about ideas. So you have ideas, so we'll help you. For example, one young woman, she wants to start a farm, a pigree farm in our Nagaland. Most of pigree farm start by the men only. We said, amazing, let's help her. While helping her, we are also making impact of helping each other should always be there. We are also creating that kind of values of supporting and helping each other. His eyes sparkle with ambition as he talks about how he wants to help young people in the Northeast. But nothing worthwhile is easy. The challenge is, especially in the Nagaland, in the Northeast sector, CSR doesn't want to invest much money there. Corporate social responsibilities. Why is that? I don't know the reason. Maybe because Northeast has doesn't much, we don't have much market value. But I think if CSR is really concerned for the impact, then I think they should not look for the market because CSR need to work for the society. So maybe this is the reason, and government doesn't have time to work along with the NGOs, most of the government. Jenpu says the people of the Northeast are often overlooked and underestimated. Have you had any experiences of that kind of thing, where um, people call you names or... I mean, like when I was coming to Mumbai, like from the Mumbai airport, the cab driver, he told me that, where are you from? I said, from Nagaland. He said, wow, it's a very dangerous state. You know, people kill people and eat people. And by the way, you people look like Chinese. The media has to play a very good role here. They only give the report of issues, you know, situations. But I think media should also focus the good things happening in Northeast. Jenpu's journey is inspiring to me because he has never given up, never been constrained in his ambition by the circumstances of his birth and his upbringing. And he is not afraid to fail. It made me think how there's so much pressure in our lives to succeed? Failure is not a problem. The problem is when you stop trying. So never stop trying. If you think about it, from when you were in kindergarten to the 10th board exams, the race to ace an exam, the taboo of failing an exam, our conditioning is towards success and not failure. How often are we prepared to handle failure? Never. And that's where Jenpu defied conventional expectations. He faced failure, and he persevered. He now wishes to inspire others to do the same. I think that's a wonderful place to end this podcast, to never stop, to keep on trying, and to keep on learning. A big thanks to Jenpu for sharing his story with My Indian Life, an original podcast from the BBC World Service. 
You can get our other episodes from this season and from season one free wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to support us, good news. You can by subscribing, reviewing us and telling your friends about us. And we want to hear from you. What do you make of Jen Poo and his struggle? All you have to do is send an email to myindianlife at bbc.com. Our producer Ishleen has been looking at some of your recent messages. Last week, we teamed up with Mercy Haruna from the BBC's Parentland podcast. Kalki talked about all the things going around her head as she gets ready to become a mother. Lots of you sent your love to Kalki. So, thank you, Vikram, Ria, Ramu, Nihar, Nishan, Anish, Divya, Sarayu, Himja, Stephanie, Vikram, Ishwinder and so many more of you. Narsimha says, I became a dad recently and pregnancy is indeed a roller coaster. Huge respect to all mothers. Larissa says, pregnancy is not easy, but it is such an amazing journey into motherhood. And Niladri says, drink plenty of water and eat roasted frogs. Mm. I think Niladri Kalki will have to pass on that one as she is vegetarian. Thanks again, everyone. So, if you're a mum, dad, uncle, auntie, grandmother or grandfather, you should definitely check out the Parentland podcast. They cover some really fascinating topics from how to manage sibling rivalry, whether we should limit our child's screen time. Mm, so, if you think they're spending too much time on their phone, how do you manage that? Also, how to care for yourself while caring for your kids. You can find Parentland wherever you get your podcast. And please, please keep your messages coming to us at My Indian Life. Once again, the email address is myindianlife at bbc.com. Or you can share your thoughts on social media using the hashtag myindianlife. Next time on My Indian Life, I was uh, sipping coffee, looking outside, looking at the Empire State Building. And I called up Ami back home in India. I made up my mind that my education, my experience, my talent, it's not meant for running after or chasing someone else's dream. I decided to come back. That's our next episode, From New York to Shimla. My Indian Life is an original podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Kalki Kekla. Our producers are Ishleen Kaur and Prabhjeet Baines. And thank you very much to our editor, Richard Fenton-Smith.